Welcome to the second session of Interact Amsterdam Virtual Festival 2020. Hello, if you're just joining us or welcome back, you have been watching this morning's talk. We have already had a fantastic session today with Bianca Prinz, Global Head of Accessibility at ING. She was talking about the business case called accessibility. Before we start, please do get involved and say hello to each other in the chat. Make sure you have switched your chat settings to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your messages. And do let us know if there are any audio issues or any issues with the stream and we'll try to get things fixed for you as soon as possible. Now we are really excited for our next talk. This talk is creating a culture of inclusivity from product manager at the Netherlands Ministry of the Interior and Kingdoms Relations, Christian Mull and Nomenta's own Senior Business Development Europe, Zoe van Wenen. In this talk, Christian and Zoe will talk you through the basics of building a digital inclusive brand by focusing on accessibility and bringing cultural change within your organization. Please do ask a lot of questions using the Q&A box. I will be asking these to Christian and Zoe at the end and we'll try to get through as many as we can. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Christian and Zoe to begin. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Christian Mull. Um, I've been uh, working for the Dutch government since uh, 2001. Uh, before that, I worked a few years in ICT. So I've worked for uh, Logius since 2012, and I guess not everybody knows Logius. Um, it's a uh, part of the Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations in the Netherlands. Um, and we have grown uh, from a very, very small organization to, uh, well, one of the, the bigger ones actually uh, within the Ministry of the Interior. Um, many people do not know LOS itself, but many people do know when you're from the Netherlands and actually is, uh, you know, DigiD, um, uh, because that's what uh, we also do. Uh, it's one of the government wide ICT solutions that we maintain and develop. DigiD is like this, uh, this uh, authorization authentication uh, method where everybody that needs to do uh, business with the uh, Dutch government can log into uh, the government systems. Um, so in 2016, I started working with accessibility uh, and I started managing a team of uh, four people, including myself. Um, uh, and since then uh, we have built a, uh, a knowledge platform accessible uh, uh, by www.digitoegankelijk.nl um, and some other uh, uh, things as well that this helps uh, the public sector bodies in the Netherlands uh, uh, get better uh, working with accessibility. Um, lastly, uh, I thought this, uh, this quote in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, was quite apt on so many levels. Uh, it's, it's something, something still, uh, accessibility, uh, that is not well known, how important it is, uh, how big the group of people is, uh, that, uh, needs this, uh, we will get, uh, talking about this later on. Um, so if you have know about this and you act on this, uh, you're so far ahead of uh, your competitors or your, uh, co, uh, organizations. Um, so yeah, very, at very many levels. Zoe? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Zoe van Wenen. So today, actually, I want to take you through my personal experience when it comes to accessibility, uh, specifically because I, I started, you know, I did an education in media and entertainment management, and I worked for a lot of di different organizations that were involved in digital, um, like Tribal DDB, which is a, a digital agency to uh, helping um, the head office of Volkswagen in the Middle East to uh, develop 11 dealership websites. And it was only until I started working with Nomenza that I found out about accessibility. So initially I was a little bit embarrassed because you know, I, I was working in marketing and digital for over 10 years um, and I never heard about it before. So I had a lot of questions and, um, you know, I started pretty much bothering uh, our, uh, our director of accessibility, Alistair Campbell, because, uh, well, he's 
you know, he's the guru internationally when it comes to accessibility. So I started asking him a lot of questions because I didn't really know at that point, um, what, what was it? You know, how, how would I be able to integrate that in when it comes to different, you know, digital projects? And once, once I start to know more about it, I realized that, you know, when from your education to being a marketing professional, it's always about exclusivity. And I started to realize that actually inclusive, being inclusive is the new exclusive. So I, um, today my objective really is to make sure that I help you maybe answer some of the questions that you have uh, when it comes to accessibility. So also at the end, feel free to ask any questions you might have. More than happy to, uh, to answer as I can. Up to you. Yeah. Uh, what, is what is accessibility exactly? Um, there's no really one, def one definition that, that, that covers it exactly. And there's discussion about it also, what it exactly is. Uh, you also heard, the te you heard it, uh, hear the term usability a lot. Um, so I would like to explain here a bit what it actually is. Um, for me personally, uh, um, some, some people say that usability and accessibility are two different things. For me personally, accessibility is a part of usability. Usability is like really making your platform usable for everybody. Um, so for you and me, uh, people uh, with all kinds of uh, uh, backgrounds, uh, it's, it's about really designing uh, your system uh, the way so everybody can interact with it uh, fully uh, uh, and, and like that um, it's, um, it's becoming more and more important nowadays uh, to be as, as usable as possible. Accessibility really has to do with uh, making your platform accessible for people with certain limitations. Those limitations can be permanent, temporary or situational. We get into that later on. Um, but um, it, it's good to have this distinction because um, I will tell this later on, but within the government now we have like a really uh, a, a legal obligation. Um, the law has been made a number of years ago already, but we now have a Secretary of State, Raymond Knops, who really finds this very important. He comes from a military background and he always tells a story where they have within the military, this um, uh, motto, leave no man behind. And it says, it just, it's the same for citizens within a country uh, where we get into a situation now that it's almost, um, well, it's not impossible, but uh, almost every interaction between citizen and government now um, uh, goes digitally. And I think 89% of every interaction is a digital interaction. Uh, and if you exclude large amounts of peoples from that, uh, you really do your uh, citizens a disservice. And the founder of uh, the, the internet, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, already said that um, uh, way back uh, that the web, the power is in its universal universality. Um, so if you have a disability or not, um, it should not matter. That, that's the big liberating thing about the web. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we're going to show a uh, short clip now, Zoe, I think. Uh, yeah, you can tell yeah just to help people be able to um, visualize what does it mean, inclusivity, accessibility. So we have this um, commercial actually from Xbox um, to take you a little bit into the world of accessibility and what does it mean for different people? What does it mean for children? So I'll just play it now. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and, yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. Do you make your own rules? It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like, 
she's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not going to change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yeah, yeah. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early yeah. on is how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I can make them crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. So hopefully that gave everyone a little bit of an understanding of what we mean with accessibility. As to, you know, one of the kids said, it means everyone can play. We're all the same. We can play with each other on the same level. So one of the points that we were talking about earlier was the difference between um, the different types of being you know, differently able. I think one of the mind shifts that I went through when I started working with Nomenza um, was the understanding of that disability. In, it was a very boxed mindset. Um, and then at the end of the day, people are all differently abled. We all have different abilities. Um, and that it's about the different features that we have and the features that our environment and I have that we live in, that there's sometimes a mismatch between those two. Um, and this could be anything from a broken arm or holding a baby or losing sight. So those are the different kinds of, um, you know, how we look at people with a different ability. Um, Christian, do you want to go into how you view these? Yeah. Um... Because I have the same thing when you're, um, well, when you think you don't have a disability or limitation, um, which I actually do because like I'm, I'm now 50 years old and I use reading glasses and uh, my hearing is uh, pretty shut because of loud concerts and stuff like that I attended in the past. So uh, I do have those limitations now myself as well. Um, and when I'm in, in, in a crowded area, I don't hear so well anymore. Or when I'm outside in the sunshine and you try to uh, look a website on your phone uh, and the contrast is really bad and you can't read a thing. Uh, there are so many situations where um, uh, usability and accessibility uh, really help you a lot. And it's something like you, you really just you don't um, uh, realize it uh, when you until you think about it, actually. Yeah. And one of the, uh, like, I mean, I've, I've been working in this field now for four years, and in those four years, I've met a lot of people with certain disabilities. And one thing that really struck me, um, and it, it saddened me even a little bit, is that those people almost always, when they cannot use a website, for example, they think it's their own fault. And it's, that's not the case. It's not their fault. It's because yeah. the website has not been designed properly and not been built properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. And I think that for me was one of the learning curves I went through as well. I mean, uh, about a year and a half ago, um, one of my siblings had an accident and couldn't use his right arm for about a year. Uh, and he's right handed. And I saw him struggling with, you know, especially apps or different kind of digital platforms. And, you know, this was before I joined Nomenza. And you don't even think about, oh, wait a minute, maybe that should be different. You know, you think, oh, well, that's kind of your problem at this point. You know, you, you can't use it. So and then once you start learning about the different um, opportunities there are and the way to integrate it so that everyone is it's easy to navigate through an application. You know, it's I was visiting a friend and she had a crying baby in her arm the other day. And, you know, she still wanted to try to do something with her phone. It's very easy to think about these day to day. Um, yeah activities that we do have that all cause us to have a mismatch with the environment. So I thought this was a very powerful um, uh, illustration to, to show. Um, also, I wanted to just double check with uh, the people present. Is there anyone um, that has a uh, that has a dif have difficulties seeing the, the, 
graphics that we have, so we can maybe elaborate on them a little bit more. If you do, please raise your hand and then we can see and know if um, we have to elaborate a bit more on the graphics that we have. No one present with a visual disability, okay. All right. Yeah. So I think, yeah, then we go into, you know, I think a topic that we've talked about the both of us quite a bit in the conversations that we have with uh, organizations is that, in, you know, they always think of it being a niche. Okay, if we, you know, focus on accessibility, it's a small group of people. Um, you know, we had our first conversation a couple of months back, and this is what we actually talked about is that, you know, there's still the view, a view of organizations that people with, who are differently able, there's a smaller group. Um, and I think you have some beautiful stats here to show us how big this group actually is. It's true. It's, uh, it's actually just last week when, when somebody uh, of a certain uh, Dutch province asked me, like, do, do I really have to make this document accessible for this one blind person in my <laughs> It's what he literally said. It's like, yeah. Okay, there's, there's still a whole uh, lot to learn for a lot of people. Okay, well, like, is it a niche or no? Well, of course, you can already uh, guess the answer uh, is that no, it is not a niche. Um, these are like some European figures. Um, um, uh, and they're really comparable with the Dutch figures, actually, it's just like it's more than 25%, more than a quarter of the people uh, that have uh, uh, one or sometimes even more than one uh, uh, disability. Uh, these are the Dutch figures. Um, and then of course, uh, you have these people with permanent disabilities and then we have already talked about people with situational uh, disabilities. And we have like this really large group now of pensioners and people over 65 and that's, that's growing all the time in Europe. Uh, and, and, and one out of three of them uh, has uh, a limited sight, for example, and, 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 yeah. and limited hearing. And like, so it's, it's, it's really a really big group uh, that yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, and I was actually, so earlier today, we had the talk of Bianca from uh, ING, and she actually had a great example of something that I cracked my head over when I, you know, during the lockdown. Um, for example, my grandmother, you know, the elderly people were all in lockdown and nobody, wanted to visit because you know the risk was too high and i started thinking how will my grandmother get groceries i don't think she'll be able to you know use an application to order groceries and she doesn't have any permanent um you know disability at this at this stage so she might not be in this list but she obviously is part of a bigger group and a immense you know growing group of people um that will benefit from accessible uh applications and, and when websites. So I think, yeah, the 25% is actually a lot larger, um, you know, taking, taking in consideration the group of people that uh, will require that. It's all of us in the end, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And also when you think about a niche or not a niche, um, you know, we often, we talk to commercial uh, organizations and, you know, they, they think of it being a smaller group that, you know, okay, if we do this, it's, it's for the social benefits. You know, we want to give, give back to society in that way. But also if you look at it from a commercial perspective, it is a huge group. Um, these were recently released numbers um, showing just how big the group actually is. Um, you will always see stuff like this happening. <laughs> um, but yeah, just showing the, the purchasing power of this group, you know, that is immense and not just first degree. So people who are differently able and their purchase uh, spending power, but also the group closely relative to them. So their friends and, and family will also have a significant disposable income. So from a commercial perspective, if, you know, you wish to look um, at your target audience and how to either broaden or um, or get that relationship st strengthened with your um, target audience. Accessibility is a, a good way to start um, because you will open up your target audience immediately and also get um, a more, I would say, emotional relationship 
um, and the return of your customer will be a much higher rate than it would be maybe today. Um, so looking at these numbers, it's not just a niche from you know, looking at uh, the size, but also economically is very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can remember talking to a blind person not too long ago. Well, I think it was three years ago, who was uh, traveling around the world for his company. And he said, when I uh, tried to book a flight at that point, the only website he could use uh, was by British Airways. Mm. It was three years ago. So there might be other um, uh, uh, companies now that have accessible websites as well. But he said yeah. it was the only site at that point where I could, as a blind person, uh, book flights uh, and uh, not get um, stuck in some quagmire or something like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and that's that's quite a big, uh, big piece of business, I guess, we're talking about. Definitely, definitely. And as we said, um, you know, we all know the baby boomers are getting a little bit older, um, but we also know they have quite some disposable income. Um, and, you know, great quote here of the head of accessibility at Barclays. And to put it bluntly, pensioners are our wealthiest customers. Why wouldn't we make sure the site works for them? Um, and that's true from a commercial perspective. You know, if you have a functional, well accessible website, which people find easy to use, and you can attract a customer base um, that has, you know, a lot of income and is, you know, I have, my, for example, my parents, my mom loves to sit on the sofa in the evening with her iPad and just goes through web shops. Um, but she definitely has a preference in some of the web shops that are easier to navigate. Um, so I think that's a very nice quote. Um, and then to take in consideration, you know, if it's a niche or not a niche. Well, there are different reasons to consider accessibility, you know, obviously from a, a legal obligation, um, but that should never be the driver. Um, the financial benefit. No, it is. I'm sorry to say, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's obviously you want to, but it's if you just, um, in my opinion, if you work towards being accessible only from a legal obligation instead of, you know, we're talking about the culture of change. Um, you know, it's it's what we get into later. It's not a tick the box exercise. It's very important, obviously, to um, adhere to the legal obligations. But I think the mindset from a company um, it it gives you the push. Um, to start working towards it, um, but I think the the overall mind sh mindset should be that it's you know um, to build a robust product, um, the financial benefits that it brings, um, all of these together I think give you um, the right motivation and mindset towards to work work towards accessibility. Yep. Yeah, I would never doubt going the legal way when I'm talking to someone from the government. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, we got this experience uh, in, in, in the United States, actually, uh, which is a situation that we don't want in Europe, but where, no. uh, well, we, we know how it goes in the United States, but uh, people make a living there by uh, suing companies suing. that have Definitely. websites that are not fully accessible. So I know that, that could be a driver, I guess, uh, if it's it's not the right driver, I would say. Um, one thing I would like to mention uh, regarding the last slide, you don't have to go back, but it's, okay. it's also actually that when you have a, um, a website that's very accessible, that you, it's also better structured automatically. And that uh, also means that search engines like Google can search the website a lot better. Uh, so mm -hmm. you much better and quicker found uh, in search engines. Definitely. Yeah. At the end of the day, Google uh, bot is a, a blind and deaf user. So yeah. how, you know, if your website is accessible, it's a lot easier for Google to, to navigate through your website. So also for organizations that really focus on their SEO, um, by having an accessible website, you will automatically work towards you know, improving that as well. Um, so yeah, great point. Um, and I think this, you know, what we are trying to lead you into is showing, for example, these two, they look and feel as if it's the same website. Um, however, they couldn't be more different. And I will show you exactly why.
So here you can clearly see zooming in, everything will scale with you. It's easy to navigate. And if you would go to this website, the experience might be a little bit different. Especially, you know, if you're on your app, one hand you have either, you know, an infant or you have a broken arm or, an, you know, if you have to go and scroll through a website in this way, I don't think any of us would stay on the website for a very long period of time. Yeah, so um, one, yeah. yeah, so designs can look the same, you know, as from the front end, it could all you feel the same, but if in reality, they are completely different. And one makes it easier for people to navigate and one is just made for a certain people, you know, group of people with a certain ability. Um, and what we really want to do is make sure that everyone can navigate through correctly. Yeah. Um, I will uh, uh, talk about this, uh, this slide. This, uh, I mean, sometimes you, you see here for the people who can't really see these pictures well, uh, these are three examples of wheelchair ramps, uh, ramps that have been made completely inaccessible by three kind of dumb mistakes, actually, I would say. <laughs> um, I mean, you've got to laugh about them, but in, in a way, it's, it's very yeah, sad. It's really sad. Um, and what happens here happens in the digital world as well. Um, and, and it's true, it's, it's not because this is like a technical problem, uh, because these ramps could have been made fully accessible very easily uh, by getting rid of the pole and not making it end in, in a couple of stairs or having a door open uh, above it. Uh, this is an organizational uh, issue. Uh, something has gone on in, uh, or gone wrong in the process. Um, and, and here you can see immediately what's wrong in the digital world that's more difficult. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, actually, you sometimes can see very clearly that things are very, uh, well, gone wrong very quickly. Uh, we'll talk about it later on. Um, yeah, but this is just great examples what goes on uh, digitally as well, where, where people who are, for example, blind uh, get stuck uh, within a cookie statement, for example, or uh, and can't get out of it. Uh, uh, really simple things that make websites completely inaccessible for people who have some form of limitation. What I also think is, is a great example here is that um, there has been money invested to get this done. Yeah. And a lot of money. A lot of money invested to get this done. Um, but then when it comes to digital accessibility, you know, we, you know, we spoke about this earlier as well, is that we often find that there's no or limited budget available while there is no difference between allowing people in a wheelchair to enter your office or for anyone to be able to use your website so i think that's still a mind shift you know that we need to work towards to make people understand that there is no difference between a ramp to enter a physical door or your website completely agree uh, you see that a lot um uh, accessibility, digital accessibility uh, mostly gets paid for by the communications department uh, of an organization uh, who have limited budgets. It's, it's something you really need to target structurally with, uh, 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 like, and mm -hmm. when you look at the returns that you get, I mean, really, can't you really invest a little bit more than you're already uh, doing now? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's it. It's, it's an investment. It's not about, you know, a lot of I think uh, still see it as an additional cost to uh, a digital project, but actually it's uh, it's an investment uh, with the return on investment. We'll go into that with the case study yeah. later as well. And actually, um, if you the line, it's, it gets cheaper to maintain a fully accessible website. So definitely. later on, yeah. it gets cheaper. And especially well, that actually leads us into the next one, because obviously there is that push that is needed, which we talked about earlier, um, and that is you know, what we said about you don't have a disability today, it's not guaranteed you know, have one tomorrow. So that's why the government is on this. Um, you know, 
there are legal, uh, you know, there are clauses in, in place right now, which we would love to hear more about from your end, in order to give that push for organizations to start working to accessibility. So please tell us a little bit about the law that is enforced this year and what's coming up in the next years. Yeah, okay. Um, well, this all finds its, um, um, uh, well, it's all based in the uh, UN Treaty, uh, um, I have to, oh, I all forget what's called UN Treaty, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, that's the one that, that was uh, no. ratified quite a while ago by all member states of the European Union. Um, and well, the, the EU being mainly a economic uh, uh, corroboration uh, have said that, um, well, to, to take all economic barriers away between member states, we have to uh, uh, make the rules for accessibility the same as well for all member states. So it started with uh, the Web Access Accessibility Directive that is really aimed uh, at public sector bodies, so uh, government organizations. Um, so not only in the Netherlands, but in the uh, uh, all the member states of the uh, European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, since the 23rd of December, September this year, uh, we have a, a legal uh, obligation for all websites with public sector bodies uh, and they have to work towards full accessibility. Um, yeah. well, they have to do that by implementing a standard. We're going to talk about this later on. It's uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG it's called. Uh, the current version is 2.1, um, but we'll get into that later. Um, and the second thing that they have to do, uh, which is quite important, is that they have to publish an accessibility statement and in that statement, it's going to be completely transparent uh, how an organization is working towards that goal of full accessibility. Um, it is based on an, uh, on an audit, so you know exactly uh, what you still have to do. Um, uh, you have to uh, give a timeline in which you will uh, uh, apply the measures that you want to take. Um, and we have seen that with this legal obligation, um, it's really have, has become quite big now within the government, the Dutch government, and I hope in the rest of uh, Europe as well. Um, if we uh, look at councils, for example, uh, we have about 350 councils in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, which actually is for citizens are, are the most important organizations because nine of 10 times the council is the first government organization that you turn to when you have need to uh, get a permit for something or if you're a new driver's license uh, renewed or what have you. Um, so uh, websites by councils really need to be very accessible that they are really working uh, well towards this. So yeah, this is for uh, public sector bodies um, working quite well now. Um, but if we go to the next sheet, um, we see that there is something common coming for companies as well, for enterprises, which is called the European Accessibility Law. Um, well, uh, I have uh, spent the last few days trying to read um, uh, the official document, which is quite dense, I can tell you, <laughs> full of legal and technical jargon. Um, but just to, uh, and, and, and there is a, a very nice summary of what it entails. And I know that probably we will uh, put this presentation later on YouTube and there can be links. Uh, put yeah, we'll, we'll share, uh, all the attendees will receive an email where we uh, will include the URLs that we'll use uh, in this presentation. Actually, so on those links, you can find a lot more information. Yeah, yeah. but um, in 2025, um, uh, there will be a legal obligation in Europe for enterprises as well when it comes to um, uh, hardware and software, actually, uh, if uh, you want to call it that, for smartphones, for example, uh, and tablets and computers, self-service terminals like ADMs, um, but also e-commerce platforms. So there's really all the websites, the big websites uh, that you go to daily to, uh, to buy all the stuff you really don't need. Um, they all need to be uh, accessible 
by 2025. Um, well, this also, also has to be put into uh, national law. I think it's going to be the Dutch uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs that has to do that, and they have to publish that law no later than uh, June 2022. So mm -hmm. then we know exactly how they have interpreted this uh, European directive into Dutch law and what it exactly entails, what you have to do uh, to show that you do, because I, I can tell just in one minute a little a little more about it. Um, for example, um, if you are a manufacturer of goods, uh, you have to draw up technical communication, communication. You have to put a declaration of conformity um, about your products or in, import stuff into Europe. Or if you distribute stuff, you have to make sure it's accessible. Um, there are going to be penalties and everything. So uh, it's really something to look out for uh, and something to start with right now, I think, to be yeah, ready for being compliant. Excellent. So yeah, let that be the push to start working already towards an accessible website. Yeah, and this is what you mentioned, the WCA, uh 2.1, um, which, as I mentioned, our uh, head of accessibility, Alistair Campbell, helped writing these, uh, these guidelines and yep. is already working on uh, a 3.0 uh, for in the future. Um, this is also which we follow in the Netherlands, am I correct? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're right, this, this is a, a universal uh, global standard actually that is being used for making websites accessible. Yeah. Uh, it is maintained the standard by the W3C, uh, the same company that uh, and maintains all kinds of web standards. Um, yeah, we, it, it's 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 uh, quite technical uh, at places, um, but just in a nutshell, you've got 50 uh, success criteria that you have to meet uh, that are, um, um, uh, what would be the word be? Well, there, there are four design principles that you see here. Uh, a website needs to be perceivable. That means like, um, well, it has to be uh, seen, of course, uh, but um, you've got a success criterion for what specifies the um, um, uh, contrast. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, it's never a good idea to put uh, um, uh, letters, white letters on a gray background, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you can never read it well. Uh, and there, uh, there are really some technical things about how to uh, the contrast ratio of your website. It has to be operable. Um, and one very big thing uh, when you can check easily for yourself if a website is accessible or not is try to navigate through a website only using your tab key. Yeah. Just uh, disengage your mouse from your laptop and try to uh, navigate with your keyboard through the, uh, the website. Um, it should be possible. Uh, and it's not difficult to do actually uh, when you're used to it, but you are really uh, amazed how many websites are not well navigable, navigable by a uh, well, uh, keyboard. Um, well, of course, it has to be understandable, um, but that means, for example, that um, when you put a graph on your website and uh, you use colors in that graph, uh, people who can't really see colors well um, don't really understand that graph. So you have to also have other means of communicating what that graph says, for example. Uh, and robust is just the way uh, that has been built. Um, I can go on for this for hours. Uh, yeah. but, uh, it's, it's quite a technical thing. You really need to uh, delve deep into this. There are experts, uh, a lot of experts who, who know this stuff, who you can, you can hire to do this for you. Um, uh, but it's it's also it's not very difficult to apply. I mean, it's it's just a lot of common sense actually. Yeah. I uh, think yeah. Um, yeah. Well, leading into that, I think once you know we, we just spoke about what does it mean to um, you as in the organizations uh, that are now attending. Um, we also did some research uh, in the Netherlands uh, the last year where we. Um, released the Nomensa Benchmark Report, um, and it actually showed that, unfortunately, not a lot of organizations are um, yet focused on providing an accessible uh, platform. 
So if we look at the main objectives that most management or you know, board meetings would involve, uh, we see them here as increasing reach and customer base, improving the customer experience or reviewing and achieving legal compliance, maximizing customer satisfaction and retention and strengthening the brand perception. If we look at these five top management priorities and we take accessibility in consideration, accessibility has a positive impact on all five of those. Um, so based on this research, what we can tell you is that there is actually a unique position right now in the market to take accessibility as a USP. Um, and it doesn't really matter what kind of business you're in. If you are, for example, a, uh, a pharmacy where people would be able to uh, apply for their medication online, I think it's crucial if you focus on accessibility, if you become one of the first uh, to really excel in, for example, an ordering system like that, that is fully accessible, or if you are a web shop, um, any kind of service that is moving, and especially today, from you know, offline to the digital world, um, accessibility will help you achieve those five uh, management priorities. Um, so this is a very interesting research that we've done. I'm more than happy to share this with you as well uh, in the email that we'll uh, send out. Uh, but it gives you a good understanding of where the market is today and how you could potentially be ahead of the curve. Um, and then we get into not, a, not just a tick the box exercise. It's where we, you know, initially where I said um, uh, legality should not be the main focus of getting into accessibility. It is a cultural change that we are actually talking about today. Um, it's about bringing inclusivity in the broader spectrum within your organization. And one of the case studies that I personally really love to talk about, obviously, because I'm Dutch and you know we have a lot of Dutch and British viewers today, we're all obsessed with the weather. Um, you know, On a day-to-day -day basis, we'll all check if we can go outside, if we have to wear a raincoat or not. Um, and I think the Met Office is one of the case studies that really show that when you work towards uh, a digital platform that should be accessible to everyone, um, there are a lot of different uh, ingredients actually to take in consideration. So what we've done is, you know, when you realize how many people are dependent on the weather and how big this group is, we're not all the same. We don't all open that app and look for the same information. But what are people looking for and what kind of information should be displayed? Um, you know, the key of accessibility is that information is easy accessible for everyone. So we took these seven personas and it, it took us six months to, to, um, to analyze, to research these. Um, you know, some people might say, well, we can do personas within a day or a week time. But we really took six months to really research and these are the seven personas that came out of there. So for example, if you look at the vulnerable, um, the sneezing lady on the right, um, it is information. For example, we all know people who have a pollen allergy, but it's not something we would think of immediately when we go to a weather app. Um, so taking in all these different personas and the information that they'll be looking for, automatically you'll be creating a more accessible website. Now taking the WCAG 2.1 and looking at your building blocks, you know, when you start with, because there was nothing wrong. It was a perfectly fine uh, app that they had before. Um, so how could we make a difference? You know, as we've shown before with the two websites that look exactly the same, it was the same here. You look at the building blocks of your digital project and you just arrange them in a way, knowing that anyone would be able to get information and would be able to access information easily. So as I said, you know, experience, it's, it's all about building an experience that is not different for a specific group of people. It is the same excellent experience for everyone. Um, so this actually caused the website, you know, it's, it, it, was a, it was the number eight before, and it went from the, the number eight most used weather platform to the number one purely because you look at it from a different angle. And it doesn't make a difference if it's a small group, but it's for everyone. So the results were, you know, coming back to the commercial benefits of it as well. The app did excellent. 
you know, we had an increase of 42 percent uh, of new users. You know, organic search acquisition increased. It is from if you look at it from that angle, it's it's an investment, as we said earlier. It truly is an investment. If you're building your application or you know your website, look at it from an accessible point of view. Think about all the different users that will require information or want to do some kind of action on your platform. And if you truly built that in an accessible way, commercially you benefit as, from it as well. And then it comes to the cultural change within the organization. So when we look at the Met Office, we didn't just help them deliver this project. We also provide them with training because um, they wanted to learn. And we, you know, we provide the, the training, but also the framework and strategy to move forward in the future and make sure that not just this specific project was delivered accessible, but in the future that every, every different project that they do um, in collaboration with the different divisions within such an organization will be accessible as well. And then, you know, something that we discussed um, as well, uh, Christian, is just how, you know, it's, it all comes down to having people within an organization initially being responsible and, and being an advocate, being a champion of accessibility and how you work together towards that digital product and the services all being um, accessible. So you have, you know, you need to define your targets. People need to be responsible. Um, monitoring whatever you have created and you know within six months or a year or even a short period of time double check if whatever you're doing is still accessible you now we're a bit a big advocate of having uh, empathy labs so having people of different abilities use the platform that you have and see them interact and see how it works it is always interesting to see and you will learn so much from it um, you know, it's all about having that shared understanding within the organization that is not one person or one, uh, um, you know, a task of one department. It's everyone within the organization that needs to work towards accessibility. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, there was actually, um, uh, there, there's actually scientific re research into this. Uh, that was carried out by uh, somebody here in the Netherlands who uh, got his PhD about two years back and he researched uh, what the, um, the the main ingredients are um, in, in well actually the, the key performance issues are when an, uh, an organization tries to uh, make their uh, websites more accessible um, and like number one, and it, it feels like you're, um, I don't know if that's English or not, like kicking in an open door. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, you need endorsement from the management. I mean, that's really number one. Uh, if the management uh, does not endorse this uh, uh, and uh, really makes it something uh, not only of the communication department or the ICT department, but uh, every uh, part of the organization plays a role in this. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so we have yeah. to watch time a little bit. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, but, no, yeah. not but to cut you off. <laughs> no, no, but it's like it's it's. Uh, this is an uh, an issue that concerns everybody, and it needs to be dealt with by everybody. That's what I want to say. Very true. Um, so yeah, that's what we said, accessibility champions, educate, ownership, create legacy, you know, build people within the organization that focus on accessibility and have people learn from each other and make it the cultural change that you want to see within your organization. So just quickly for everyone who's been patiently watching us, because I know we're going a bit over the time. Um, but yeah, a plan of action. So now you've listened to us, you think maybe, you know, we have to get started on accessibility. Where do we start? So first thing is know where you stand. You know, um, as you mentioned, an accessibility audit um, gives you a perfect indication of where you are today um, and also where you need to go. Um, and say it, say it as it is, apply for an accessibility statement with the government, Christian will check it. Um, and with that accessibility statement, um, you, you know, not just you, but everyone knows where you are today. Um, and get real about it. Um, 
And Omenza has an accessibility assessment available, which allows you to analyze your company, your organization is where you are today and strategize. Um, you know, you need to get a plan. Uh, get consultancy. You know, if you don't have the in-house knowledge, don't be afraid. Knock on a door. Uh, knock on our door and we'll help you um, to work towards a more accessible uh, platform. And build legacy, training. Take the knowledge that you can, divide it within the organization, have the accessibility champions ready to work on it within the different departments and keep that knowledge coming in within the organization. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, like it's plan, do, plan, do, check, act. It's really, uh, it's not something you will excel at right from the start, but um, if you keep working towards it, uh, you get better, uh, your organization gets better and you'll reap the, reward, the rewards for everybody. Excellent. Um, awesome, so that was our presentation. If you do want to get into accessibility assessment, you can uh, apply for it free online. So that's the link, we'll send it to you as well. Feel free to reach out to me or Christian if you have any questions. Um, but if you have questions now, we still have some time left. So feel free to ask us anything you like. Thank you very much, Sewing so Christian, for this great overview of accessibility. I think it was covering really well the basis of it. We got a first question from uh, Anonymous. So all uh, are foreigners and residents who cannot speak well a local language, for example, Dutch, in the notion of this inclusion included, what about language barriers in this issue? So I'm going to give the question, I think, to Christian. Um, yeah, well, it's a good question, actually. Uh, um, I mean, are we talking about really different language or barriers within the same language? Because accessibility does address issues about barriers within the same language. Um, the question like is actually for both. Yeah, it's actually yeah. for foreign languages and within the same language. Yeah, well, the... the uh, trying to answer really quickly, uh, WCAG has three, level, three levels, A, double A, and triple A. Uh, language barriers are addressed in triple A. Those for uh, public sector bodies, uh, the triple A requirements are not mandatory because they're very difficult to check. I mean, how can you really check uh, if a language is like, how simple is it or how difficult is it? It's difficult to make that um, uh, decision. Uh, but like from one language to another language, I know of no uh, regulations for that uh, within accessibility, usability. Um, uh, couldn't really answer that question. I mean, um, uh, language is extremely important because that's the number one issue when you try to access information. So make it as easy as possible. That would be my recommendation. Perfect. So you want to add something? Yeah, I think it comes down to um, knowing your market. So in the Netherlands, uh, I think it's, you know, we know what are the main languages spoken. Um, and I, if, 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 you, if you do your research um, and you are aware of, you know, type of languages that are expected um, on your website uh, to integrate those uh, and make it easy, you know, easy for people to, to switch between those different languages. One, one more uh, comment within the government in the Netherlands, we have, it's not obligatory, but we say you have to use uh, B1 lang language is called. I don't know if that's an international thing, but B1 language uh, is used for people who have a certain uh, cognitive level. Uh, we sometimes in Dutch call it Jip and Janneke taal. You know how we would translate that. <laughs> But really use short sentences. Uh, uh, don't use words for more than three uh, simplify, syllables. Simplify, simplify your text. As much as possible. We got another question from Anonymous. I have occasionally seen sign languages content for videos. Are these studies and or best practices regarding content for hearing impaired people? Which is better, closed captions or sign language interpretations? Uh, both actually, uh, they're equally important. Um, for people who are born deaf, um, the written language is a second language normally. Uh, like people who are not born deaf, for them it's 
uh, easy to hear. And for them, it's much easier also to, uh, to learn how to read uh, because they know uh, process words in another way. For mm -hmm. many people who are born deaf, sign language is their first language. Uh, that's why, for example, in the Netherlands now, it's, uh, I think it's now a legal obligation. It's going to become a legal obligation that in certain uh, communications, uh, uh, sign language is uh, proscribed. Um, I think in a lot of other European countries it's going to be that as well, but really do both. Uh, when you address people, show sign language and do closed captioning. Yeah, because it's also if you know I if if you don't know how to read sign language, but you will always find yourself. There's always a point where you find yourself in a situation um, where your surrounding doesn't allow you to watch a video, for example. Um, you know, if you forget your earpods and you have to watch a video for work and there are no subtitles, you know, no, um, and then you sit, you know, somewhere and you have to 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 listen to it out loud. Um, so it's it's definitely you know goes both ways. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you again, Christian Soli, for this interesting session. So I think we're coming now to the end. It's time. But I would like to say uh, we'll having an, another talk at 4 p.m. Amsterdam time, 3 p.m. London time. In this talk, Jimmy Kalu, senior product designer at the World Remic, will talk about accessibility is a dirty word. So if you haven't signed up yet, there's still time to do. Go to Eventbrite and sign up. And I'll see you all at 4 p.m. Thank you very much for joining. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.